So I'll be talking about uh, joint work with Jamie Morgenstern, who's making a cameo actually today at the conference. Uh, she did this when she was visiting at Stanford. Now she's a postdoc at Penn. Uh, so the workshop is called Complexity and Simplicity in Economics. And a lot of this week, we're exploring that theme in the context of mechanism design. So what makes a mechanism complex or simple anyways? So there's not a unique answer to this question, but let me open with a couple of examples which sort of capture the, you know, which illustrate the kind of simplicity that I want to capture. So in a 2009 paper with Jason Hartline, we called it simple versus optimal mechanisms, we studied domains which, you know, are squarely in the realm of Meyerson's theory. So we knew what the optimal mechanism was. These are single parameter settings, independent private values. So we know the revenue maximizing mechanism is just a virtual welfare maximizer. So our motivation for this paper is we said, well, you know, you look around in the world, and so think about the non-symmetric case where bidders have independent but not identical valuations. The virtual welfare maximizers you get in those settings, they don't really resemble auction formats that we see out there in the real world. So we were wondering, could we have a more sort of realistic, simple, if you will, auction format that uh, had a performance guarantee that was almost as good as the theoretically optimal Meyerson mechanism? And most of our results uh, focus on the case of the VCG mechanism, so just welfare maximization, uh, but coupled with reserve prices. And monopoly reserve prices are the natural ones to use. And we identify conditions under which, in fact, VCG with monopoly reserves is a good approximation of the optimal mechanism. So for example, Metroid feasibility constraints, regular valuation distributions, arbitrary downward closed environments, MHR distributions, uh, and things like that. Okay, so this was sort of what we held up as a simple versus optimal result. Nowhere in this paper do we say what we mean by a simple mechanism. We leave it as sort of a subjective or, or self-evident uh, you know, adjective. And uh, you know, ha had you pressed me at the time, you know, what am I trying to get at? Why, how do I justify that the mechanism on the left is simpler than the one on the right? What I would have said was, well, you know, imagine you range over all possible choices of the valuation distributions for the bidders, F1 through Fn. What class of mechanisms do you get on the left, ranging over all distributions? Well, you just get the VCG mechanism with all possible choices of bidder-specific reserves. Okay, so some, in some sense, n degrees of freedom in the mechanism design space, where n is the number of bidders. On the other hand, if you do the same thought experiment on the right-hand side, now when you range over distributions, you range over all possible virtual valuation functions for the bidders, which feels like a much larger, or maybe even infinite number of degrees of freedom. So that's, that's not a formal statement, but that, that's the intuition I would have said uh, back in 2009. So the last five years, we've seen a lot of really cool, simple versus optimal uh, approximation results. Uh, so one example, it's a justly celebrated result from last year, Bob Ayafi, Malika, Lucier, and Weinberg. This is now a multi-parameter setting. So they were thinking about one buyer where you have K items, uh, additive valuations with independent valuations across the items. And this is, you know, trying to figure out the optimal mechanism, revenue optimal mechanism in this setting is very hard. And in fact, that problem's occupying many of the greatest minds in AGT as we speak. So Bobby, if at all, we're, we're saying, well, you know, if we relax to approximation, you know, can we get a, a practical sort of simple auction format with a performance guarantee? And they showed that the answer is yes. Okay, so they said, well, for any distribution, independent distributions over the, over the items, either the mechanism that just always sells all items together, the grand bundle, and of course, if you're going to do that, you may as well monopoly price the grand bundle, or if that doesn't work, then you can just sell the items separately. Okay, and again, if you're doing that, you may as well use uh, monopoly reserves. Right? So those are the, if you, for every distribution, the better those two will be a constant factor. And again, to me, this feels like, you know, maybe, okay, maybe like K plus two degrees of freedom in the mechanism space on the left, right? So you have a choice of monopoly reserve for each of the item. You have a choice of the monopoly reserve for the grand bundle. And then maybe you have like an extra bit about whether you sell items separately or sell the grand bundle. Okay, so again, like ballpark K degrees of freedom. And we heard earlier this week, Andy Yao's very elegant extension to the multi multiple buyer case. Rubinson and Weinberg have an extension to some additive valuations. So these are, I'm holding up as sort of uh, illustrative simple mechanisms, again, currently undefined. So the goal for today is to propose a rigorous, a quantitative definition of the simplicity or the complexity of a mechanism, or rather of a family of mechanisms. Now, why do I want to do this? Well, for several reasons. One reason is just so that we know what we're talking about. So, you know, we can actually say something's a simple mechanism and, and mean something mathematical. But once you have a formal definition, it opens up research directions, which otherwise wouldn't really be well defined.
So, for example, if you have a, you know, we, we know how to measure near optimality, right? We do that with performance guarantees, approximation ratios. If we also have a way to measure simplicity or complexity, we can now treat the mechanism design goal of wanting simple mechanisms with good guarantees as a bona fide by criteria optimization problem, right? So you can ask about, for a given simplicity budget, what kind of approximation guarantee can you attain? Or for a given approximation, a one minus epsilon approximation, for example, what kind of complexity is necessary in your mechanism to achieve that kind of revenue guarantee? And again, that doesn't, you can't even pose those questions questions without some kind of definition. And then the other thing you might hope for, and this will indeed be the case today, is that if you had a good definition of a simple mechanism, maybe they would have extra desirable properties for free. Okay, so simplicity would imply some other good thing. And for today, the good thing you're going to get is you're going to get uh, good results for learning. So if a family of mechanisms is simple, uh, you'll be able to learn the best mechanism from that class with respect to an unknown distribution with polynomial sample complexity. All right, so before I dig into more of the details, let me just sort of position this work with respect to the literature and even other things you've seen earlier this week. So, you know, mechanisms can be simple in many senses, and, you know, all but one of those senses I won't be discussing today. Uh, so, for example, something we heard a lot about on Tuesday is being simple to play. And so, you know, the good news is, is I'll just be thinking about dominant strategy and Seneca paddle mechanisms, so just, you know, our boring old d -sick friends. Uh, I won't be making any distinction between, say, you know, mechanisms that are even, even better for the players to play, like the deferred acceptance auctions that Paul and Ilya talked about, or the obviously strategy-proof mechanisms that Lee discussed. So I'm making no differences between different kinds of uh, d -sick mechanisms. Um, so a second thing, so for the motivating applications, as you saw, the type spaces are all pretty small, so direct revelation mechanisms is, is sort of a reasonable thing to do. If you're thinking about something like full-blown combinatorial options, auctions, you don't, you don't even want to think about direct revelation mechanisms. You really need a message space or a bid space which is smaller than the type space. And so there, there's a really interesting notion of simplicity where you measure how big the type space is or how many actions are available to the players, and you can actually sort of characterize efficiency guarantees as a function of that notion of simplicity, again, not talking about about it. Probably the historically earliest attempt by computer scientists to impose some kind of simplicity constraint, the mechanism design was just, you know, let's at least force them to run in polynomial time or polynomial communication. Okay, so that's the field of algorithmic mechanism design. It's been hugely successful. Not, though, super relevant, actually, for the motivating examples I gave you at the beginning, right? So, like, the very first example, we were comparing VCG with monopoly reserves versus a virtual welfare maximizer. With respect to computational complexity, those are polynomial reducible problems. Okay, those have exactly the same complexity. So, this won't let me differentiate between the different mechanisms in my motivating examples, or at least not, not in the first one, certainly not in single parameter settings. Let me give a quick shout out to a couple other pieces of related work that are, are very kind of similar in spirit to what I'm talking about. Uh, first notion, menu complexity by Sergio and Noam. They introduced this a couple years ago. It's a very nice definition. It's led to a lot of interesting work. This has, it shares really the same goals I had a couple slides ago. So you wanted to have a concrete measure of the complexity of a mechanism so that you could ask about revenue complexity trade-offs. And they do that. They give a, a precise definition. What's the definition? Well, you know, think about a player. So by the taxation principle, you know, once you fix everybody else's reports, really what a player faces is a menu of allocation price pairs, and it can pick its favorite one, in effect. So that's one way to think about uh, strategy-proof mechanisms. So the menu complexity just says how many different options might a player have in the worst case. Okay, so that's the menu complexity. And uh, so I guess, you know, again, it's just not quite a good fit for, for the examples I want to discuss today, basically because, you know, while maybe menu complexity is a sufficient condition, for a mechanism to be regarded as intuitively simple, it's not a necessary condition. So for example, as soon as you choose a price at random, you have infinite menu complexity, okay? Secondly, think about like the, you know, single buy or multiple item setting. Think about selling items separately. How many different outcomes can the bidder acquire for itself? Well, it can pick any bundle it wants, right? It's the items are sold separately, you just pick, pick them. So there's two to the K, okay? So already selling items separately gives you exponential menu complexity. They, they do propose a fix for this additive menu complexity, but I'm looking for something kind of a, a little different. All right, second paper, uh, which is many years ahead of its time. It's entitled Mechanism Design via Machine Learning, Balkan, Blum, Hartline, and Mansur. 
So they also uh, propose a notion of mechanism complexity, again, for families of mechanisms, uh, based on covering numbers from machine learning. And so that's really drawn from the same circle of ideas as the measure I'm going to tell you about, pseudo-dimension. It's not technically the same, but it's sort of drawn from the same area of machine learning. And here are the main differences. You know, they, they did this work basically about 10 years ago uh, when prior free mechanism design was all the rage. So this is where you don't even, you don't even assume there's an unknown distribution. You just assume there's no distribution. You want a worst case guarantee. And so here you even have to figure out, like, what are you shooting for? Like, what's the benchmark? So they solve all these problems. They propose the benchmarks. They give mechanisms competitive with these benchmarks. But because of the demanding prior free setting, they're not going to be able to cover the same uh, range of environments that we will when we do assume unknown distributions. For example, single item auctions uh, are not covered by the theory. And that's certainly one thing I want to I be able to reason about today. Okay, so what is the measure? So the measure is actually not a new measure. It's been around since the 80s uh, from statistical learning theory. It's called the pseudo-dimension. Uh, I'll give you a formal definition in a couple slides. Uh, I'm not going to give it to you now for a couple reasons. First of all, I mean, when I think about what I want you to take away from the talk, I, I more want you to remember what this does for you, like what are the implications and applications of this definition than the definition itself. Secondly, you know, if you know VC dimension, then you know this, okay? And that'll be clear when I give you the definition. It was just really just sort of an adaptation of VC dimension to, from binary to real valued functions, okay? But the point is, for the moment, take it on faith that I will associate a number to every set C of mechanisms. Okay, and C here might be infinite. Think of C as like, you know, VCG again with all possible choices of bitter specific reserves, something like that. So why should you care about this definition? Okay, well, the first reason is conceptual, which is that it really seems to kind of capture the intuitive notion of how simple or complex the, in the mechanisms and the motivating examples are. So for example, maybe let's just think about single item auctions for a second. Suppose you just take like the second price auction with all choices of an anonymous reserve. Okay, it feels like one degree of freedom. And indeed that family of mechanisms will have constant pseudo dimension. How about with bitter specific reserves? Again, just say like a second, second item auction with bitter specific reserves. Well now you have n degrees of freedom. And again, the pseudo dimension is growing basically linear in n. It's totally possible this log factor is just an artifact of our proof, okay? but it's certainly uh, ballpark n. How about back to the single buyer case? So the Bobby F. et al. mechanism, which as one possibility, you know, either does the grand bundle or sells items separately. Well, there you can prove that the pseudo dimension is growing basically linearly in K, as you'd sort of expect with the degrees of freedom argument. Okay, so in contrast to the menu complexity here, which is uh, exponential. Virtual welfare maximizes, on the other hand, even in a single item auction, that doesn't have finite pseudo dimension at all. Okay, sort of again, uh, mirroring our intuition that there are an infinite degrees of freedom because you have a, a full choice of a virtual valuation function, okay? So it seems to give, you know, on sanity check examples, it seems to give you kind of very sensible, uh, sensible results. The second reason to care is that, again, there are implications. So if your family of mechanisms is simple in, in this sense, then you automatically get good sample complexity properties. So let me talk a little bit uh, about learning mechanisms from data. Uh, so Jason talked a little bit about this in his talk, uh, but let me just review to you the whole model. So again, this is not a new result. This, is, this has been sort of a you know, bedrock result in statistical learning theory, which says low pseudo dimension is a sufficient condition for low sample complexity. So what do I mean by that? What do I mean by sample complexity? Well, it's, it's a standard pack learning type model, if that's something you're familiar with. But the basic idea is you observe, you posit that there's an unknown distribution, okay, over valuations. Okay, you don't know what it is, but you posit that it exists, and that's where bidders are coming from, okay? You assume you have data in the form of samples from this distribution, okay? So you know about this distribution only in as much as you have SIID samples, okay? You can think of this, you know, in practice, you can think of this as, you know, bid data from past auctions, ignoring incentive issues if you have repeated bidders in these auctions, okay? And indeed, there was a, a, a field study on, on sponsored search auctions at Yahoo where more or less maps pretty directly to this kind of way of reasoning about auction design. Anyway, so you don't know the distribution. If you knew the distribution, you'd just run the optimal mechanism, like Meyerson's mechanism. So as a function of the samples only, you have to figure out what mechanism you're going to run tomorrow for a fresh set of bidders drawn from this exact, these exact same populations, okay, with valuations drawn in the identical way. How do we evaluate the quality of your mechanism? Well, whatever you pick, we just draw a new valuation profile from the unknown distributions, and we look at the revenue you get. Okay. And so basically you want to have a smart function for choosing this mechanism so that the revenue you get on a random draw is almost as good as the optimal mechanism, almost as good as if you knew not only samples, but the full distribution. Okay, and then the sample complexity is just saying, how big does S need to get 
before you're guaranteed with high probability to be able to compute a mechanism M, which is almost as good as the optimal mechanism. Okay, so that's the sample complexity. All right, so uh, this is really starting to explode, which I think is cool. I think it's a really great topic, um, beginning with a paper, again, way ahead of its time by, by Edith, who I think is in the audience somewhere. Uh, so there's a lot of people working on this. There's a lot of exciting stuff to do, which is really cool. Um, so let me actually go now actually tell you what is the implication, okay? So now that hopefully maybe you think it's a reasonable problem to want to learn an auction that's optimal for an unknown distribution, what do you actually get from low pseudo-dimension? So if the pseudo-dimension is D, Okay, so this is like corresponds to the one or n log n or k log k. That's what d was a couple slides ago. Uh, then the sample complexity is scaling linearly with d. Okay, so it also has quadratic dependence on one over epsilon squared, which shouldn't surprise you. There's different versions of this statement. I'm going to state the version where you have bounded valuations between zero and h, and you want additive error epsilon. Uh, and so then it's also going to be scaling quadratic in h, okay, the, the bound on the maximum possible valuation. So again, so the point is that low pseudo dimension is a sufficient condition for low sample complexity. Okay, so if D is small, if D is polynomial on the relevant parameters, uh, then this is also polynomial on the relevant parameters. Okay, so at least modulo capital H. Good. So what's the guarantee? So then what's the formal guarantee? So what's the learning algorithm? The learning algorithm is the trivial one, often goes by empirical risk minimization. So you just draw this many samples. You just look at every single auction in your class. You look at which one does the best on the data, and you just pick that one. Okay, so you literally just use the training data, optimize for it, and then use that in the future for test data. And that's the mechanism for which this guarantee will hold. So with high probability over the samples, the mechanism which is best in the training data will be within, one, will be within epsilon uh, on, on future, future samples. Okay? So this is the sense in which if it's simple and having low pseudo dimension, you automatically get low sample complexity. Yeah. So VI is a function? Um, VI is evaluation profile. Should I think of it as a vector or as a function? Think of it as a vector. Okay, so like in a single parameter setting, this would be an n vector with one valuation per bidder. So that's additive evaluation? Oh, it doesn't matter. So for this, for this is totally agnostic. I mean, this, I mean, this is really just if you ever have a mechanism uh, class with low pseudo dimension, this will be true. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Mm -hmm. So in this general learning setting, the pseudo dimension doesn't characterize learnability. So to what extent is it, you know, it's sufficient for, the, yeah. to what extent is it necessary? So that, that's an excellent question. That's still um, largely open. Um, what there, what, you know, what you can say for some of the, so some of the dependencies I state, I state to you will be optimal up to log factors. Uh, because there's a separate paper with Richard Cole where we prove a linear lower bound on sample complexity. And so since, you know, and, and then it sort of matches our pseudo dimension upper bound. I suspect it should be close to a characterization, like say up to log factors in most cases that we care about, but that's sort of a conjecture at this point. Yeah, I think it's probably pretty tight though. That's my intuition. Good. Okay, so if you're simple in this sense, you get low sample complexity. Good, so what, so I, I do feel like I, I do owe you the definition. So, um, so there's two slides which are a little technical. And so, so my goal for these two slides is the following. If you sort of know VC dimension, then my goal is for you to actually understand the two slides, more or less. Okay, because just as a delta from VC dimension, because it's really a very small delta. If you've never seen VC dimension, then, you know, I, I just want to, you know, if you're very quick, then you might get this also, uh, but it's going to be a brief, it's going to be brief. So, um, but these two slides, if you don't understand them, it shouldn't impact your ability to appreciate the rest of the talk at all, right? So you can just take this definition on faith and then, you know, t it's analytically tractable and it gives you good stuff, okay? All right, so, uh, so the twist with VC dimension is a sort of an extra quantifier which involves choosing thresholds. So where do these come from? So VC dimension is about binary functions, okay? Zero, one functions on a domain, okay? Now, so how, how should we think about an auction? So here's how I want you to think about an auction. Think of an auction as a real valued function, okay? What's the domain? The domain is a valuation profile. What's the output? The output is just the revenue that this particular mechanism gets on this particular valuation profile. All right, so the domain is all possible valuation profiles. For a fixed mechanism, you get a real valued function from valuation profiles to revenue of that mechanism, okay? So, but these are not binary functions. These are real valued functions. So how can we make them binary? Well, kind of the easy way to make a real valued function binary is you just set a threshold. And you say, well, let's call it one if it's above the threshold, let's call it zero if it's below the threshold, okay? And that's it. That's like the only difference between pseudo dimension and VC dimension. 
Okay? So formally, you have to define a notion of sets being shattered. So this is just like in VC dimension. So remember, our domain is valuation profiles. So a subset is gonna be a collection of valuation profiles. You can think of this as like training data if you want. It's just some abstract set, finite set of valuation profiles. What does it mean to shatter this set? It means that there, there's some way I can choose these thresholds. Okay, revenue targets, if you like, T1 through TS. So one revenue target for each of the samples. So that no matter how I label each sample as being either above the threshold or below the threshold, I can find a mechanism in this class that matches the labeling. Okay, so I might pick a subset which says like, on samples one, three, and five, I want you to beat your revenue target. On samples two, four, and six, I want you to not, I want you to be below the revenue target. And the claim is no matter how I choose above and below, you can find a mechanism in this class that matches my request, okay? So it's measuring how expressive, sort of how, you know, different the outcomes of these mechanisms can look like as you range across the class, all right? So that's what it means to shatter a subset, and then the pseudo dimension is just gonna be the largest uh, subset that you can shatter. Uh, and sometimes, like with virtual welfare maximizers, you can actually shatter arbitrarily large subsets, okay? So that's the pseudo dimension. Now, one, you know, even if, you, even if this doesn't make any sense, one high level point I want you to take away is that even, though, even if you don't understand the definition now, I want you to have the sense that it's actually analytically tractable to prove bounds on this measure for classes of mechanisms that we care about. Okay, so I'm just gonna show you a slide with a proof sketch on the slide. And again, if nothing else, just realize, you know, it's just some kind of commentarial arguments that everybody in this room is perfectly capable of doing. It's really just not a hard thing, okay? Okay, so let's go to, as an example, single item auctions with bidder specific reserves, okay? So it's just a single item, second price, bidder specific reserves. The claim is that the pseudo dimension is n log n. And again, I'm just gonna give you kind of, I'm gonna sort of oversimplify this a little bit, but this, this should give you the gist. Uh, so what does it mean? It means that the only subsets you can shatter are those with size n log n or less. Okay, that's what we're trying to prove. So pick your favorite subset, okay, S. Suppose you shatter it, let me argue that S has to be small, okay? So the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna think about ranging over all auctions of this form. Okay, so we range over all second price auctions, all choices of the bidder specific reserves. And we look at how many distinct labelings we can possibly generate for this set S. Again, what do we mean by labeling? Set your favorite revenue thresholds, look at, look at whether this mechanism is above or below the threshold, that gives me a binary labeling of the sample. Okay, so I range over all possible mechanisms. Each mechanism gives me one labeling. Maybe a bunch of different mechanisms give me the same labeling, but I look at the number of distinct labelings that I get, ranging over all mechanisms. What does it mean to shatter the set? It means I get all possible two to the S labelings, okay? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna upper bound the number of labelings that I can generate over this mechanism class, okay? Because it's not a very rich class. So how do you do that? You do that in two steps. So in the first step, I'm just gonna have equivalence classes of these mechanisms, so buckets, if you will. So you've fixed your sample. So what is that? That's really S samples. Each one is a value, is a profile of N valuations, right? It's a single item auction, N bidders. So S, it's like a S, S by N matrix. So I have S N numbers, and then you have N degrees of freedom. You can choose your N reserves, okay? So first I just look at an equivalence class where the relative ordering of your choice of N reserves is the same. Okay, so the way it's interspersed throughout these SN numbers in the sample is the same in all classes of some auction. Within one of these equivalence classes, the allocation rule is fixed, right? Because some of the relative order of the reserves and the valuations are the same. You know, a second price auction with reserves, it only uses comparisons in its allocation rule. So once I fix the relative ordering of everything, I fixed the allocation rule. Now, as you vary, even holding the allocation rule fixed, as you vary, uh, so by allocation rule, I mean the winner, okay? And uh, as you vary the reserve, you do change the revenue, but it's in sort of like a very simple way, right? So like if you have two different auctions and everything's the same except the revenue is epsilon different, obviously, you know, it's changing in a very benign way, the difference between these two mechanisms. So how many equivalence classes do you have? That's just sort of all different ways of inserting N numbers into SN numbers. So that's NS raised to the N. Uh, and then you can just do a different counting argument, which again gives you some exponential and N only number of labelings per equivalence class. Okay, so summarizing, what are, what are the key features of this? So the number of labelings is the product of two different things, each of which only has an N in the exponent. The important part is that neither of these numbers has an S in the exponent. Why is that important? How do we shatter a subset? You need all possible labelings. You need two to the S labelings. Okay, so if the number of labelings is not growing exponentially in S, but the requirement for shattering is growing exponentially in S, there's gonna be some limit S at which you can't shatter anymore. Okay, and it's gonna be n log n if you solve for it. Amri. Right. 
about uh, randomized mechanisms? Yeah, so for randomized mechanisms, uh, in some sense, if you ignore, I mean, basically, um, what's the right way to say this? So uh, anyway, I mean, it's possible to extend the argument. I, I guess you have to do some more work, but um, good. Yeah. Okay. So again, the point of that was just, you know, it's not trivial, but it's analytically tractable to bound the pseudo dimension in cases of interest. In fact, the argument I just gave you, I really used very little about a single item auction. That n log n bound continues to hold even for you know pretty much arbitrary binary single parameter environments uh, for the VIC, for the VCG mechanism with better specific reserves. So, what's the takeaway from this? So. Again, what we hoped for for a simplicity measure at the very beginning, as I said, you want to automatically get other stuff for free, basically. So there's this, there's this part of the literature, which I'm a huge fan of, where you design simple mechanisms, subjectively speaking, and you prove approximation guarantees. And the way one thinks about these is, you, know, you, think, that, you think as if you know what the distributions are, but you're only going to use like a little bit about them. You'll only use monopoly prices, for example. Okay? And so what this meta theorem says is that, you know, actually simple mechanisms in the sense that we've been using it, actually you don't even need known distributions. Okay, it even works with unknown distributions in a polynomial number of samples. For example, consider the Bobby F et al. simple versus optimal mechanism. What does it say? It basically takes as input the distributions, it figures out the relevant monopoly prices, and it takes the better of two things. Okay, and that's what it returns. Okay? So that sort of known distributions output a simple mechanism. Because that class has low pseudo dimension, again, only scaling linearly in K, from a poly in K number of samples, you can do exactly the same thing. Because you can get exactly the same 7.5 approximation or six approximation that Aviad proved up to an epsilon, even though you didn't know the distributions at all, even though you only had poly and K samples from those distributions. So the way to think about it is the simple versus optimal results that the community has been proving, they don't really need known distributions. They work fine if you just have samples. Okay, okay. so let me just finish with one last point. Um, so, you know, I said at the beginning that one reason you might want a concrete simplicity measure is so you can actually really reason about simplicity versus optimality trade-offs, okay? And again, we know how to measure approximate optimality. You just use the approximation guarantee. Now you can use pseudo-dimension to measure the simplicity of the class. So if we return to the first simple versus optimal theorem, I stated that VCG with monopoly reserves is a two approximation to the optimal, and this factor two is tight. You might say, okay, can we somehow gradually increase the complexity of our mechanism class and then gradually get closer to full optimality. Is there a nice interpolation between VCG with monopoly reserves and the full-blown Meyerson optimal mechanism? And so there is, and you can use the pseudo dimension to you know, reason about exactly what kind of trade-offs you can get. So the claim, this is, there's not a claim that this is the unique way to do this, but this is a way you can do this. So to make VCG with reserves more complicated, I'm gonna allow you to set T reserves per bidder. Okay, T, T here's a parameter. Okay, so obviously the bigger this is, the bigger your mechanism space. What's the meaning of having multiple reserves? Let's just say it's a single item auction, okay, although it extends to other settings. Who's going to be the winner? The winner is going to be the bidder that clears the maximum number of their reserves. Okay, so if you said 10 reserves for every bidder, and there's some bidder that clears eight of them, and everyone else clears seven or less, that one who cleared eight is the winner. Okay? If there's a tie, you break ties by value, say. Okay? So that's a T-level auction. And so the number of degrees of freedom, right, is clearly growing as n times t. Right? You have t choices of a price for each of the bidders. So how well does this do? Well, it's, it's easy to extend the previous arguments about the pseudo dimension. Now it's growing linear in n and t, again, up to a log factor. And so then the question is, okay, so suppose you set a revenue target of one minus epsilon, and you ask what kind of uh, you know, complexity is required to get this. Well, if you restrict it to T-level auctions, then you can figure out that the value of T you need uh, is you know, something like H over epsilon. Okay, that's for matroids, for downward closed environments, it's more like HN squared over epsilon. But the point is, it's, it's polynomial on the relevant parameters. Okay? So given an approximation guarantee, this basically gives you advice about how many reserve prices T and therefore how much complexity you need in order to achieve that guarantee. So I'm out of time, so just wrapping up. So uh, what I'm proposing is not a new definition, it's actually an old definition uh, of pseudo-dimension from statistical learning theory. Viewing mechanisms as real-valued functions, you can literally just apply this definition without change to families of mechanisms. A priori, is that a good idea? Not clear. but I've hoped to convince you through a number of examples that it seems to give us what we want. It seems to give us uh, intuitively quantify the number of degrees of freedom in a mechanism design space in a way that previous parameters have not. 
despite the fact the definition you know, has a bunch of alternating quantifiers, for most of the settings that we study and the families of mechanisms that we care about, it's tractable to prove upper bounds on this. And with a good upper bound, you get automatic sample complexity results, therefore sort of automatically extending simple versus optimal results from known distributions to samples from an unknown distribution. I want to be clear, at no point in this talk did I discuss the computational complexity. So for example, the running time of these learning algorithms based on empirical risk minimization. I think this is a wide open area where I think there's lots of opportunities for good research. So let me stop there. Thanks. Uh, how about Gabriel? Um, so I guess I you know, started at the beginning of the talk talking, uh, talking about sort of informal, uh, informal concepts. There's a number of degrees of freedom in a mechanism family, and this is a way to formalize that. Are there, uh, are there any examples I should think of that would distinguish the formal concept of pseudo dimension from what, uh, from what I might sort of vaguely think of as number of degrees of freedom? Yeah, but I do think it's a, it's a little more general. Um, yeah, I, there's sort of a, I think it's fine as a mental model to have a rough equivalence. I mean, but for example, if you have a finite set, then the pseudo dimension is going to be a log of the cardinality, and it's not clear how to define the degrees of freedom. And there's other, you know, there's other examples like that. But there's also like hard to describe classes of finite VC dimension that are just actually crazy. Sure. Uh, so in, in particular, any fixed mechanism yeah. has pseudo dimension one. And I okay, to so. Uh, in the sense that, you could define, you could find there are classes of sets that have a low VC dimension, but each of those sets is very hard to describe. So, so you, you could have something, I mean, you're picking up something that could be orthogonal to simplicity. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, I'm certainly, there's no claim that this is the only relevant definition. I'm just trying to claim this is a relevant definition. Uh, if you're convinced of that, I'll be happy. Uh, Kevin. So uh, you've got these real valued functions that go from values to revenues. Um, presumably, you could you could do it with welfare as well. Correct. Uh, I mean, when you're talking about simplicity, um, uh, you're trying to appeal to something intuitive from our perspective about the mechanism, not something to do with, with ultimate revenue of the mechanism, I guess. Well, I mean, what, what what does that mean about the, the the claim that this has to do with simplicity and and, and what other concepts maybe besides welfare would also make sense? Yeah. So I mean. For the first question, I mean, kind of any objective function is fine. Now, it might factor in to the pseudo-dimension calculation. So when we actually do the pseudo-dimension upper bound, um, you know, we do sort of work with the revenue uh, formula. Um, but sort of the, the general thing about pseudo-dimension gives you low sample complexity, that's sort of independent of the choice of the functions. So you're sort of right that it's, it's, it's measuring, it's kind of, it's, I mean, it's, it's not really about the mechanism itself and more about the behavior of the mechanism as filtered through, you know, some summary statistic. Um, and so, you know, a natural one is whatever objective function you care about, but you, you could do something else. So, you know, obviously, you know, if you have, uh, so in some sense, you could have mechanisms which seem complicated if you just wrote down the description, and yet somehow it's very well behaved with respect to your objective, and you're going to get a low pseudo dimension. And that may or may not be a good thing, sort of depending on what you're trying to capture. I mean, like, I wonder, could you even do something, maybe this is a terrible idea, but, but could you even do something like, you know, a welfare up to a, a factor of the best welfare or something, and you get a price of anarchy kind of simplicity. Or, is it possible to have something that's, you know, more, um, more sort of processed than... Uh, sure. Sure. I mean, you can. You, I mean, you could. I mean, because right, you take as input evaluation profile. So at that point, the welfare is well defined, and you can look at the welfare. So if you want, you can define the real valued function as the approximation, and then you'll be looking at some kind of expected approximation factor over your domain. So it's very agnostic to what these functions look like. But as you say, I mean, if you choose certain functions, it may hide certain things we think of as complexity, which just don't show up because of the function that we chose. Yeah. So your initial motivation was that, well, it's easier to learn some numbers, but it's very difficult to learn a function because it's infinite dimensional. But in practice, we can approximate, just like your last result, mm -hmm. you can approximate a function pretty well for our purposes uh, and get almost the same result as we wanted. So then why couldn't you just approximate the optimal Meyerson asymmetric mechanism by learning these distributions with some approximation? In the, in the, the same speed as you would just learn the surface. Right? You can, and, and I think actually for the computational complexity results, that's probably the way to go. Um, but sort of the point is, I mean, so what comes out of this, you know, just the sample complexity, is you don't always need to learn a lot about the distributions just to actually make the right decision. Right, so 
so the usual way you go through empirical revenue uh, maximization, you know, so you know, like in some of, some of your early work, is you actually kind of estimate the distributions directly, and then you run an optimal mechanism with respect to the learned distributions. This doesn't require, like, so you're not, you're not responsible for outputting, say, like a you know, good approximation under some norm of the real distributions. You're just responsible for outputting the best mechanism with respect to your objective. So that can lead to better sample complexity results. It certainly leads to simpler algorithms, um, but I think for computational efficiency, we'll probably have to go the route that, that you're suggesting. Thank you.